This is uh, Dr. Ricky Scott, chair of the mayor's committee. I'm calling the March 2022 uh, meeting of the, our committee to order. First of all, let me say, uh, since this is St. Patrick's Day, I certainly hope everybody enjoy, uh, they will enjoy this day. And uh, if you don't have green on when you're out in the street, just hold a dollar bill up and uh, I think you might be covered. But uh, first of all, let's go around and see all who's here today. Uh, Ricky Scott, Chair. This is Philip Woodward, Vice Chair and Public Information Chair. And for those of you who can't see me, I have a bright green leprechaun hat on for St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. <laughs> Sharon Benton, Treasurer. Donnie Biss, member. Donnie Biss, transportation. Robert Parrish, uh, committee, subcommittee chair for housing. Alice Kelly, member. Do we have any guests? I'm Matthew Clark from Go Triangle. All right. And then Aaron Conberry. Oh, go ahead. JP Mansell, uh, Raleigh Planning and Development. Aaron Conberry with Go Triangle. Sean Abrams here with Go Raleigh Access. And Paula. This is Monica. Sorry. Go ahead, Paula. I'm done. Thanks. Sorry, this is Monica Barrow. I think a lot of us show up as Matthew Clark because we used his link. But um, I am a, a consultant with Go Triangle. Uh, Tim Poten is also a consultant with Go Triangle. I think hey, you got it. Okay. Hey, Dr. Scott, this is Demetrius Edwards. Um, if you have Matthew Clark's link, can you rename yourself? Because I don't want to call all you Matthew Clark. Um, also, JPR, and then also we have Tony Hall which is a guess as well. Okay. How, do, how does Thank one you. rename themselves? Do you I know? I think you just hover your mouse over your picture. There are three dots that appear in the top right-hand corner. Click those dots. Ah, and got it. You should be able to rename yourself. Great. Thank you. Learned something new today. Yeah, me too. David, did, uh, oh. Demetrius, did Eileen not make it? No, I have not seen her pop in yet. Huh. Oh, okay. She might have forgotten. All right. Um, but, okay. Um, Kirsten is here as well from the state, um, from North Carolina Office Kirsten, of State Human yeah. Resources. She is here as well. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, shuffle the agenda around just a bit because I think we have a couple of presenters here today, one with uh, Go Triangle and I think someone from uh, Planning and Development is supposed to be here. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Edwards? Yes, sir. JP is from Planning and Development. He's on the line as well. Okay. All right. So let us, let us move forward. With, uh, with these presentations. So let's start with, um, let's start with the uh, Go Triangle. So the floor is open to you. All righty, would it be all right for me to share my screen? Yes. Let me try that just one more time.
There we go. All right, and is my presentation up on the screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, we can see it. Thank you all for having us here today. Uh, once again, my name is Matthew Clark. I'm project coordinator for the Greater Triangle Commuter Rail Project at Go Triangle. Uh, we have with us um, from our team, Aaron Convery, uh, Monica Barrow, and Tim Potens. They can uh, feel free to chime in if I say something wrong or if there's additional information that's helpful. The Greater Triangle Commuter Rail Project is about 40 miles um, of passenger rail service between West Durham, um, sort of near Duke University Hospital, about a mile away from there. Within the North Carolina Railroad Corridor, there are stops in downtown Durham, East Durham, and then down to Ellis Road, RTP, Morrisville, Cary. There are a few stops in between Cary and Raleigh. There's a stop at NC State University, downtown Raleigh, Southeast Raleigh, uh, and then on down to Garner. There's a stop in a place called Al Auburn that's sort of uh, right near Garner and then potentially on to Clayton in Johnston County. So it's a, it's a pretty big project that we're working on right now. The project is in the stud, uh, feasibility study phase, which means that we're just getting started on uh, the planning and some uh, preliminary engineering regarding the project. The project is made possible um, through a partnership that exists between the counties, Durham County, Wake County, and Johnston County. The Metropolitan Planning Organizations, CAMPO, um, is the, the one in Raleigh uh, and surrounding areas. And then DCHC MPO uh, is Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization. And then NCDOT's rail division is working very closely with us, as is North Carolina Railroad. North Carolina Railroad Company actually owns and leases the rail corridor. NCDOT sponsors the current intercity passenger rail in the corridor, and they have other rail safety, um, rail highway safety mandates. The Metropolitan Planning Organizations, they oversee the Triangle's transportation planning and funding activities. So we're talking about additional passenger rail service in an existing shared rail corridor. And what that means is that today we have inner city passenger rail service, the Amtrak trains that uh, come through Durham and Cary and Raleigh. But we also have freight service. Freight service moves cargo all over the country uh, in North Carolina, Norfolk Southern operates and maintains freight service within the North Carolina Railroad Corridor. Uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? No. Okay, okay. sorry about that. Um, and we just want to note before moving forward that the reason why uh, the project costs what it is. The reason why it's as complicated as it is is because adding capacity for additional commuter rail service, additional commuter rail service, more frequent service in the morning, in the evening, and uh, in the middle of the day and in the evening, that is going to require additional rail infrastructure. Um, and and that, that is what we're working on right, right now to understand the feasibility of constructing and uh, that additional infrastructure operating and maintaining commuter level service uh, within that 40 mile corridor. So how did we get here? Well, there have been several major investment studies. Um, the, the one in particular that relates to this project is the Wake Durham Commuter Rail Investment Study that was completed in 2019. We completed phase one of this feasibility study in, in 2020, um, and we're currently uh, working on finalizing phase two. 
of the feasibility study. Some of the things that we've learned is that we could have as many as 10,000 trips um, per day in the year 2040. Um, and we also think that, you know, the, the time that it would take between Durham to Raleigh would be around 45 to 50 minutes. The current capital cost estimate, and again, this is changing as we have a, get a better understanding of the infrastructure and needed in the corridor to provide the level of service that we're thinking about. But the current cost estimate is around $2 billion. And then the operating cost estimate is uh, somewhere between 29 and $37 million. After this phase of feasibility study, if um, it looks like the project is feasible, and if the decision makers, elected boards decide they want to move the project forward, uh, then we could move the, pro, uh, the, the project into the Capital Investment Grants Program uh, that is administered by the Federal Transit Administration. That program is the means through which we would achieve federal funding from the Federal Transit Administration for this project of up to half of the project's cost. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what we, are in, we have included in phase two of the feasibility study. It includes, in addition to rail analysis, which looks at where the train should stop, what kind of infrastructure is needed, what kind of ridership would we have. We also took a look at um, an opportunity analysis along the rail corridor to, to take a look at things like, well, how much affordable housing is in the corridor? Um, what sort of access to jobs would this project provide? Um, things of that nature. We've also conducted several rounds of public engagement um, and we're uh, continuing engagement throughout the end of phase two of the feasibility study. And so I mentioned our goals are to refine the project concept estimate those benefits through the opportunity analysis. We're gonna update the cost estimates and make sure that we think that the project is good, good to go into the federal funding pipeline. I wanna move now into, some, into a discussion of some of the aspects of the project that we're thinking about regarding accessibility, especially uh, related to our stations and our trains, rolling stock. And I've got a video here that I'm going to uh, play. I hope it plays and narrate for you. Once the train comes to a complete stop, the conductor will open the doors for you to board. Once aboard, find your seat on either level. Oops. Let's try this one. So the train pulls up to the platform here. The train floor is a bit higher than the platform is, looks like. So the conductor rolls out a bridge and opens the bridge so that people can get off the train. Oops. I apologize. I'm in my office today and there's construction going on. So there's some loud noises you may hear behind me. And this is a train in Orlando. Once the train arrives, the conductor steps out and unfolds a portable platform that connects the train to the station. This allows an easy boarding process and help is always available if needed from the conductor. The train features priority seating for the elderly and disabled and the seats are foldable for more space. The restrooms are also wide enough to allow easy access with a wheelchair, with grab bars and lever operated sinks inside. Overall, the Sunrail is a convenient option for those that are looking to travel Central Florida without paying the price of a taxi or shuttle. Each of the 12 stations have the same ADA compliant layout, allowing guests in wheelchairs to travel just as easily. 
The personable level of assistance and well-equipped carts make this an outstanding option for visitors in the area and locals as well. Okay, so when we're looking, we're thinking about accessibility for our trains in uh, the corridor, you know, we could have uh, up to 40 trains a day, 20 round trips a day uh, for the project. We're thinking about how do, how do we make those trains accessible so that everyone can use them. Um, and because the uh, corridor is a shared use corridor, because it's shared with freight trains and other inner city passenger trains, um, there are some requirements that we have to meet um, related to uh, those, those trains. Uh, railroad standards and rolling stock design can result in some gaps. There could be a vertical gap, um, as is illustrated in the first picture here, where there are stairs involved and there are alternatives to overcoming that vertical gap. And then there can be a horizontal gap where there's a bit of a space, as you can see here, um, between the platform and the floor of the train. Uh, and so uh, there, those are two different kinds of challenges that we come across in a corridor like this one. Um, high platforms that would allow for level boarding of trains are, um, not permitted on tracks that are shared with freight trains. And uh, low level platforms are limited to about eight inches uh, in height. Um, and no, there's no train that has a floor that is as low as an eight inch platform, which means that in the case that you're sharing tracks with freight, there's going to be some kind of a gap that needs to be overcome between the platform and the floor of the train. Here are some of the solutions um, that can help us overcome those gaps. There's a mini high platform. And what, what the mini high does is um, it's almost like a, well, like it, like it says it is, it's a miniature platform that's higher than the standard platform height of around eight inches. Uh, and that helps facilitate a connection from this higher platform to the train floor. And then that solution can, can be combined with a bridge plate. Um, as was in the videos, uh, the conductor would sort of unfold or could uh, lay down a, a bridge when the train stops to allow easy passage. And then there are also lift options. Um, there are lifts that are attached to the trains themselves. So carborne lifts, the, uh, the lift that comes out of the train car. And then there are platform-based li based lifts, uh, lifts that sort of roll up to the train and that are founded on that platform. We've done a peer review of commuter rail systems that uh, were created since 1990. Um, 12 systems have assisted boarding of some type with a bridge plate with um, a carborne lift or a platform based lift. And then 12 systems are able to provide level boarding um, because they are, are in a different situation than uh, having to share a track with a freight train. Um, or they have some other different uh, situation where they are. Level boarding would be unique in a shared corridor with the characteristics of ours. Um, and so we're looking into solutions and we're exploring the feasibility of the various solutions. There will be three locations where there are passenger only station tracks. So there are three locations where there are special tracks that the freight trains won't go on. Those locations will have level boarding. Um, so you won't need a solution to overcome the gap. And then uh, the other locations on the shared freight main line um, will have you know, some combination of carborne lifts um, and those other methods we discussed. 
And so for next steps, we're going to continue our public engagement. We're gonna to continue to explore the feasibility of um, different boarding scenarios with North Carolina Railroad, the, the owner of the corridor, and we're gonna produce a recommendation um, related to boarding um, for our trains. At this time, I just wanna thank you all for letting me be here. I'm, we're really interested in hearing about your experiences with trains. Um, we want to make sure that we learn from those experiences as best we can. We have a great opportunity given that the project is very early in its development to really learn from those experiences, um, take those into consideration as we produce recommendations for going forward. And I'll open it up for discussion or questions. Uh my name is Robert Parrish. I am president of the Wake Federation of the Blind. I have a couple of questions for you, sir. Uh, number one, uh, is that scaled down and what's left over it in a structure bill um, going to pay for any of this? That's a good question. We're looking into that right now with our partners, uh, North Carolina Railroad and uh, NCDOT, you know, they're both looking at that bipartisan infrastructure law that was just passed. There may be some opportunity and there may be an opportunity to work with them to get funding for infrastructure in this corridor. Um, that would be great. You know, it would be, yeah. it'd be, it'd be great to be able to reduce that price tag. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, my second question uh, is, I mean, you don't, you just simply don't have time for me to tell you about the experiences that I've had with Amtrak. <laughs> uh, but I will scout down to uh, my question. I noticed that you uh, spent a good quantity of time talking about uh, at, uh, the ramp and accessing people into the train. I noticed the wheelchair user. Um, have you considered uh, getting persons to train uh, you're a personnel for uh, sighted guide for the blind and how to be with blind and visually impaired customers. Yes, and we understand that there are far more considerations than just that, you know, that gap between the platform and the train. There's the matter of getting to the platform itself. Um, there's uh, the matter of making sure that transit connections are accessible and, and are transporting folks to the right location so that they can access the platform. And so because the project is very early in its development, we will have the opportunity to plan for those things as well. Uh, this you. is Dr. Ricky Scott. So then what I understand you say that in this planning phase and what we are uh, expecting is that the disability community will be uh, part of these initial conversations so that uh, you don't have to engage in retrofitting or trying to figure out something after this project is well on its way. That's correct. Um, there will be there will be plenty of opportunities for us to reach out, take into consideration experiences and feedback um, as we make these decisions going forward. The boarding piece is um, just one consideration, I would say, yeah. of, of all the different things that, you know, we will have a chance to think about, get feedback on, um, and make decisions about. Uh, the, the boarding piece in particular is a little tricky because of the nature of our corridor, uh, the corridor being shared with Amtrak service and with freight service, um, where, where we have the ability to put station tracks, um, tracks, special tracks, the freight trains do not go on. Uh, we will be able to provide that, that level boarding um, uh, in areas where the corridor is shared with freight. We will have to use some combination of the solutions I discussed, the, the bridge plates um, and uh, the lifts, carborne lifts. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, right, sir, this, well, uh, let's, uh, I have one more quick comment, Dr. Scott. Uh, this is, I, I just want, and I want to, uh, I just want to emphasize what something uh, that Dr. Scott uh, 
Very well pointed out. We've heard this before. <laughs> We're gonna look into it. We're gonna no. Here's the problem. There's a lot of good intention, but again, it's it's like people retrofitted for the disabled community. I urge you to reach out, really reach out to uh, organizations like Disability Rights, uh, National Federation of the Blind, because we're all the time helping people after the things are built. You know, I'm one who says, I, I've, I've said this to museums of art. If these guys would make it accessible out of the box, we wouldn't have to go through all this problem. So I wish you really would consider that. Will all right, do. well, we certainly, we, we certainly appreciate your coming and we are certainly wanting to be able, if, if there are any additional questions that people may have after this meeting, feel free to let, to, to communicate those questions so that an open line of communication can, can be uh, retained. And we certainly would like for you to come back to uh, give us an update at a, at a future date. Thank so, you for having me today. We appreciate the opportunity and we'll be back. All right. Thank you so uh, much, sir. No, I'm sorry, go this is Paula and I will contact to you if I have your information too, um, so that I could discuss what my concerns are on that um, project. Um, I think that what I see on your video is awesome because it didn't have it in past years at different um, train stops. So that's going to be awesome. But I do have some issues I'd like to discuss with you, though. Could I get sure. your contact? Thank you very much. On the, um, on the meeting contact? Thank you. Yes, Demetrius, please feel free to share our contact yes. information, um, and we'll be happy to answer any additional questions. All right. Thank you so much, and we look forward to hearing from you uh, in the future. Thank you very Matthew, much. Matthew, before we wrap up, um, there was a question in the chat about whether the videos have captions or subtitles. Um, are you able to maybe provide links with those resources if available? Yes, I can. Um, the, the videos, um, the first and the third videos are from YouTube and I do believe they have captions. And I'll uh, pass right. this date along to Demetrius as well. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming for you and all of and your group coming to uh, present for us today. Again, we look forward to uh, your coming back and providing us with an update. Meanwhile, we will now shift gears to uh, have a presentation uh, from the uh, Planning and Development uh, staff here with the city. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm JP Mansell with the City of Raleigh Planning and Development Department. Uh, I'm here to present uh, the Dix Edge Area Study, um, and I will share my screen. Are you seeing my screen now? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Um, so I I'm excited today um, to talk to you about this study. So um, we've been conducting this study in the um, in this area south of downtown and east of Dorothea Dix Park now for for about eighteen months. Um, and so the the project area um, is bordered on the uh, west to uh, of with Lake Wheeler Road, um, to the north is downtown, um, to the east is South Wilmington Street, and then Carolina Pines is, is sort of the southern border. Um, at pl the Planning and Development Department um, does these studies um, to identify capital improvement projects which often come in the form of physical infrastructure, like uh, bike lanes or road improvements. And we also um, look to add additional uh, guiding policies to the comprehensive plan, which is you know, a very large document that sort of guides land use and development decisions um, in the city of Raleigh. And so this area was chosen for a planning study for a few reasons. One um, is 
the surrounding investment that's happening around it and within the study area. So we're seeing significant private investment in downtown. Um, and also we're seeing in this study area, private, large private investment in the form of the downtown South development and uh, the Park City South development. Um, and so um, we're seeing that private investment. We're also seeing the large public investment that will trans uh, transform Dix Park over the next few decades. Um, and so those are a couple of factors um, for why we chose this, this area to study. Um, we also know that up until relatively recently, um, this area was, was relatively affordable to live. And so um, the investments plus that relative affordability means that this area was um, very likely to experience rapid change. And uh, this study was created to focus on creating recommendations and actions that would manage that change while looking at connecting the area um, to, to surrounding areas. And so um, we focused on housing affordability, displacement, land use and transportation um, through this study. And so, um, like I said, this has been uh, going um, since fall of 2020. And so we've held um, workshops and other engagement um, activities throughout 2020, 2021. Um, and currently we are um, working to finalize our final report um, in which we'll, we're hoping to present to city council um, in late spring. So probably looking at late May, um, maybe early June. Um, so over the course of the study, we, we tried to engage the broadest range of, of people possible. So. Um, this slide is sort of a compilation of those efforts. And, and so a component of that strategy was spreading out some of the work. So we had um, 15 community leaders and four neighborhood ambassadors as a part of this project. Um, community leaders were volunteers from the community that we met with monthly. Um, we would present ideas for engagement and also um, early drafts of our recommendations just to see if they agree generally with, um, with what they see as, as the community interests. Uh, we also um, kind of asked them how could we improve that engagement um, throughout the study. Uh, neighborhood ambassadors were um, paid temporary employees of the city who lived in the community and helped us sort of reach out to the community, whether that be through distributing materials, um, translating for our Spanish speaking population or, or sort of general guidance on, on um, how we can improve engagement. Um, and so throughout the study we had uh, 300 public participants. We visited 33 businesses, shared information with um, local nonprofits and schools, and posted yard signs in English and Spanish, and, in, and had a total of 28 workshops um, that included uh, a range of activities that included small pop-ups, workshops over Zoom, in-person meetings, and we also had a community cookout in Eliza Pool Park, um, and that was sort of um, brought to, the idea was brought to us by one of our neighborhood ambassadors, just really wanting to offer the community something in return for, you know, speaking with us about their concerns. So we provided food, there were some games, um, and I think all in all went, um, was a pretty effective um, and, and fun event. Um, and so the feedback we gathered through all of that engagement was used to guide the study recommendations, which I'll sort of talk through now. Um, so the top concern we heard from the community was affordable housing. Um, you know, we heard that housing prices in the area were rapidly increasing to the point where displacement was becoming a concern. Um, we also heard from a lot of people that they were getting constant calls about selling their property, and you know, they weren't sure if whether you know whether these calls were real or not, or if you know these were just you know people trying to take advantage um, of sort of the the historic uh, low prices and 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 really you know kind of act and not in their best interest. Um, and so, and we also heard that density, you know, was, was supported if, you know, we're providing more affordability. Um, so one of the major immediate actions coming out of the study was a city initiated rezoning of city owned property to, um, to develop affordable housing. And so um, about a month ago, city council authorized staff to, um, rezone or start the process of rezoning three city owned properties, um, which will end up being developed into affordable housing. And, and the three properties are 1500 South Wilmington Street, which um, is, a, is a large property that's bisected by South Wilmington Street. It's along the Walnut Creek Greenway. Um, 
and it's shown as number one here, uh, 15 Summit Avenue, which is at the corner of Summit and um, Waterworks Street uh, and Zero Waterworks Street, with the, which is just Caddy Corner uh, to that property. And so um, we're looking at probably at least a couple hundred affordable housing units on over the these three sites. And um, once we are through the rezoning process, a, a request for proposals or RFP will be issued to um, to work to, for a partnership with the private developer to develop the actual affordable housing. Um, I think one of the unique things about this action was the fact that we're kind of moving ahead of the study on this. Uh, normally, we would have the study adopted by city council and then start implementing those actions, but we just heard from the community that the affordable housing component was just too important to wait. And so we really wanted to get that action started and moving um, just to, to really indicate that we're, we're ready to take action on this. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about affordable house, housing, that can vary um, depending on who you're talking about. What we're looking at as from the city perspective um, is housing units that are affordable to uh, households earning 30% area median income to 80% area median income. That 30% translates roughly to 20, uh, roughly 21,000, that 80, um, that 80% is roughly um, 55,000. And so um, having targeting with that range, we wanna have an average of 60. So you would have, you know, we would still cover some of that, that, that lower range while still um, maximizing the number of units by targeting a little slightly higher income level. So that's kind of the strategy with the, the actual um, income levels that we're targeting. Um, and this is just, um, there, there was a rendering done by the Urban Design Center, um, just to show that um, that one of the sites could, in fact, uh, have some development development on it. It's it's got a lot of floodplain, and there's a greenway there. So just um, kind of wanted to show um, that there could be development on there. So that's what that kind of that's showing. Um, some of the other recommendations coming out of the study around affordable housing were. Um, supporting the ability of existing homeowners to remain in their homes through the homeowner rehabilitation grant. Um, this would provide funding to lower income homeowners so they're able to make improvements um, to their home that they may not have been able to do otherwise. Um, we're also looking at um, improving homeowner and renter education and awareness around these future displacement concerns. So um, a big part of that is developing a community group that would help area residents understand real estate matters better, um, including what is the fair market value of their property, you know, what are the rights um, as a renter so you're not getting taken advantage of. Um, and so for both of these first two recommendations, I think a big part of that is understanding what the city is already doing um, and really providing that information um, and, and engagement to make sure people already know what's already what they're already able to access. Um, and so that was kind of a big part of that strategy. Um, and, and again, just wanting to pursue uh, new affordable housing development. Um, and a part of that is understanding that the market isn't supplying it enough housing. So that's driving prices up. And so, um, you know, any new housing isn't likely to be affordable to people making below area median income. So we have some recommendations around providing subsidized affordable housing. Um, and uh, we also um, understand that change is happening. So we want to ensure that the, a variety of housing options are available so that, you know, if, there, if a property is redeveloping, it's not just redeveloping as a large single family home, but there's options for apartments, for duplexes, um, for townhomes, you know, more affordable types of housing. Um, another part of um, the study was looking at transportation, including um, a couple of new designs for some of the streets in the area. So one of those was um, Lake Wheeler Road from South Saunders to, to Maywood Avenue. Um, and so what that road looks like today is basically just two car lanes. Um, and that's right alongside Dix Park. Um, and so what we're looking at doing is uh, basically adding um, a large sidewalks on either side. So uh, a 10 foot sidewalk on the Dix Park side, a 10 foot sort of sitting area, um, you know, kind of just a, a place for people to sit and hang out. 
uh, a 12 foot bikeway that would, you know, include, you know, you would be a multi-use path. So there would be, um, or sorry, that would just be for bikes. So you would have, could be going on either direction on a bike in that, on that bikeway, which is 12 feet wide. Um, still having just two car lanes, including a median that includes um, some green stormwater infrastructure that would um, help beautify the street, but also provide some utility in terms of absorbing stormwater um, runoff. Um, and then also adding a, a sidewalk on the, the Fuller Heights side of, of Lake Wheeler. Uh, we are also looking at um, Hamill Drive. Um, and so um, that's, that street is currently a dirt road that runs um, basically northwest to southeast from Lake Wheeler Road to South Saunders Street. Um, and the future design would include two paved car lanes, five foot bike lanes that are located behind the curb. So you're not um, really at risk of interacting with the car traffic on a bike or, or uh, as a pedestrian and also, you know, the, the two 10 foot sidewalks. So, you know, taking that, that dirt road and turning it into something that um, everybody can use. Uh, and, th and this is included as a part of a private development that is hap happening right now. It, um, the pro properties around us were recently rezoned. And so this would probably, you know, would likely be installed through that private development. Um, we also have a whole slew of other recommendations, but really wanted to highlight those two, the affordable housing and the new streetscapes. Um, you know, we have recommendations on land use and rezoning. Um, there, there are amendments to the comprehensive plan that would guide decision making for things like rezonings, which is, you know, where people are asking city council to change the laws um, for what they can build on their property. Um, also looking at um, new affordable housing through density bonuses. So allowing developments to build taller if they include, you know, affordable housing, just having that as an option. Um, and also new street connections. And, and one of the things we heard during the study was this area is close to a lot of things, but it's hard to really get there. There's, there's not a lot of um, interconnectivity. And so recommending new places for streets and also um, connecting the greenway system better throughout the study area. Um, and so that's kind of an overview of that study. Um, my contact information is here and I can provide it to Demetrius if, if there are any follow-up questions, but I'm also happy to, to answer questions um, for you today also. Um, and, I, and I do have oh, one. Yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, um, I do have one question. Yes, we are indeed running close on time here, but I wanted to ask in reference to these three projects that you mentioned, uh, these three developments, uh, what are the total number of units you're talking about? You mentioned about a couple of hundred being for affordability. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear anything about accessible affordable uh, units. And because I think that uh, we, we are certainly at a challenging point in Raleigh's uh, history here with affordable and accessible housing that, uh, you know, our efforts are, are um, uh, we're, we're, we're steadily falling behind, just to mm -hmm. be straight and honest about it. Um, and uh, with developers being able to decide what percentages uh, whether it's fifteen percent, ten percent, or whatever, and whether these commitments are beyond ten or fifteen years, but that that's not a conversation for us here. But but those are some major major concerns here. But mainly, how many units are you talking about? And yeah, how many total units are you talking about here versus the two hundred that you mentioned that would be uh, looked at for affordability? So um, the 200 I mentioned was just for those three sites and those are city owned properties. So we can guarantee those are gonna be affordable for a long time at certain uh, income levels based on the RFP that we issue. Um, and so, you know, that's, those are at least 200 guaranteed affordable units. I think outside of that, you know, would be private development. And so it's kind of hard to, to quantify like how much potential development there could be, but um, you know, with the with the affordable, we know that's gonna those are city-owned properties that we're gonna keep 
um, city owned properties and, and will be developed for affordable housing. Um, and so not don't have the exact number um, of total units, but definitely at least, you know, a couple hundred, if, if not more, depending on how the site design and, and what proposals are submitted once the RFP goes out. Okay, so you're saying that we we don't have an idea of the total number, but we are reasonably sure that it may be 200 units out of yeah, the it's a, uh, yeah, total units. It, right, a total mm -hmm. affordable, correct. Okay, all right. Well, we certainly appreciate your uh, coming and presenting to us and providing your contact information so we can continue to follow up and ask some additional questions because like I said, this is a very uh, complex issue and uh, uh, we could spend two or three hours on this. Right, yeah, I'm happy to follow up with any, you know, any questions. Yes. All right, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me see what time frame we're dealing with here, people. Okay, uh, so let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Edwards, do you have any kind of report from uh, the executive director or from city liaison here for us? Um, yes, sir. Um, just one uh, mean you touched about was city council's yeah. Um, decision. Either I can talk about that, or you want to talk about it, Doctor Scott. No, you can go ahead. And, okay, go, go ahead and go ahead and take it on. Okay, um, thank you, Doctor Scott. Um, so, City Council has made a determination that um, boards and commissions are to uh, return back into person starting April. Starting in April. Um, also, uh, what we have done is uh, we relocated um, all of our board meetings that we oversee within our department into our building at 900 South um, Wilmington Street, but I can send all that information out. But one of the reasons why we relocated um, all of our board meetings to our building is one, accessibility. Uh, we have free parking, so literally once you enter into our building, take the elevator, come up one flight of stairs, we'll be meeting in our conference room. So it's a lot easier to get in and get out. And also you don't have to pay for parking. Um, also, um, a lot of other board members have been saying they're not comfortable with returning back into person. Um, if that is the case, um, please let me know. But also please, um, working with Dr. Scott, please email your um uh, city council liaison and just let them know that you all are not comfortable with returning back into person. Um, and so that's the update that I have right now at this time. Okay, all right. Well, I certainly would uh, want our members to have input on, on that before we make a uh, determination I would not wish to make a decision independent of what the uh, members felt about that. So I would like for all of you to contact me to let me know what your thoughts are on that. So we can certainly communicate that to uh, Mr. Ed uh, Mr. Edwards. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, treasury report, please. Unfortunately, I haven't received the report. Well, I suspect it's probably the same, huh? We <laughs> yeah, have I'm, pretty sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't gone shopping, yeah. so. Yes, and it's I still haven't the same. The debit card yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, Lori is not here with any scholarship. Just I want all of you to encourage people that you may know who. Uh, might be interested in applying for the scholarship who live here in Raleigh. Uh, just a note here that uh, they, uh, there is a scholarship for a graduate student. So um, if you know someone who's pursuing a master's, feel free to let them know that they can submit an application. We want to make sure that they are aware of it. And we are doing um, uh, 
more than two scholarships for undergraduates. So, so that's that's great news. Okay, uh, Vice Chair, you have any report for us? This is Paul Woodward. Thank you, Ricky. Um, I have a couple things for my vice chair report. First of all, I want to share that in February, Asbury Church hosted a memorial service for our former member, Ronnie Marshall, who passed away. And I um, was one of the speakers who gave remarks at his memorial service. And I want to point out that Robert Parrish and Bob Evans attended from our mayor's committee. Um, if anybody else attended and I didn't see you, though I apologize for missing your name. But one person who did attend was the mayor herself. And she came up and spoke to me afterwards and said she was very upset about Ronnie's passing. Oh. It was very nice that she was there in attendance that day. And so there were at least 50 to 75 people there. So it was a very nice way to memorialize him. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is that March is Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. And the North Carolina Council on Developmental Disabilities is, has been hosting a number of events or things to recognize this. And I believe Lori has shared some of that information. Um, in one of our emails because we have a page on our website dedicated to this month. And that's all I have for today. Thank you, Ricky. Okay, thank uh, you. Philip. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. I was just gonna say the uh, Memorial for Ronnie was also held virtually where I did attend that. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for mm -hmm. providing that uh, and we're glad that all of you were able to attend uh, his memorial service, and he'll certainly be missed. Uh, from the chair's desk, uh, I did want to report that, and I provided these issues and concerns over to uh, uh, Mr. Abrams, and he can certainly uh, comment on them. Uh, that we, we did get several complaints, or a number of them, one was related to customer service that uh, we certainly need to look at ways to improve upon that. Uh, secondly, there was a complaint about uh, several, or at least the ta taxi cab company who reported that they didn't work on Sunday. And so the rider was left without any transportation. So we need to figure out how to uh, make redress uh, to that. And, and really when one contacts dispatch uh, about a, a not uh, about a, a concern that dispatch doesn't have the authority to make to take corrective action. Uh, typically this occurs on the weekend or can occur during the week, but we need to have a system that's much more responsive to these situations so that uh, our riders will not be left uh, in the lurch, as it were, or not being able to have uh, transportation. So um, that is what I have from the chair's desk. And Mr. Abrams, uh, can you give us a, a transportation report? Yes, I have a couple things um, that I can share with you. Uh, thanks uh, again for everybody for having me today. Uh, the first thing I'll just uh, speak to what you just uh, talked about, and those were the the customer service issues. Um, and I'll just say again, those are all customer service issues. Uh, all those things I am aware of and have had conversations with multiple people about those kinds of things. So. Um, we'll be working going forward to um, resolve some of those issues, um, especially those issues that occur um, over the weekend. That seems to be an area uh, where we have a lot of um, issues um, in particular. 
Uh, so I'll get into a couple other things as far as uh, 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 free fares um, going forward. Um, at this point, um, transportation has uh, entered a budget um, with uh, free fares up into uh, June of 23. Um, oh, really? That budget is going to have to be approved by a city council at this point. So we're just waiting yeah, is that for a through, city council. Through June of 23? Yes. Through June of 23, not to June of 23. Right through June of 23. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. All right. <laughs> so that's um that's that's been placed in the budget. And again, that just has just has to be approved uh by city council. So that's where we are with that at the moment. Um also I sent a uh a, a new version of the application for uh access customers to uh Dr. Scott today. I'm actually just got that version in today. Um, so hopefully some of you will get a chance to kind of take a look at it, um, see what you think about it, and we'll be looking for um, comments um, on that. Um, in some news that uh, it may not seem, I'm sorry, the light's going out here. It, it may not seem um, that good, but um, I'm going to uh, look at the positive side of this, and um, that's just about the app that we discussed previously the, huh. the Uber style app that we've been talking about with Route Match. Um, yeah. So uh, with that particular project, um, we, we kind of had to take a step back um, and reevaluate uh, what was possible and what wasn't possible. And at, at this time, um, we agreed, meaning us, the city of Raleigh and Route Match, that um, uh, what they may have available is not suitable for us at this time. And, um, they are not exactly able to provide us um, what with what we um, need. We want to um, maintain a, a, the integrity of the current system and be able to um, make uh, changes, um, progressive changes down the line um, for our service. And at this time, we just didn't feel like that partnership was working in that direction. Um, so. Um, we got a clean slate now. We're going to start over again and um, get to working on that. We already have some um, folks in the pipeline that we've been talking to anyway all the while. Obviously, we, we just didn't um, stand pat with that. We were working on other things all the while, and um, we're, we're going to see where that takes us. So for now, um, that, that application, that uh, system is kind of on hold until we figure out exactly um, who we're gonna go with and, um, and, and what they can do. We definitely have a clear um, plan in mind as to what we want, and um, we're not gonna take any um, shorts on that. Uh, with that, that's all I have today. Um, if anybody has any questions for me, be glad to take them. Yes. Ms. Paula, I have Before, a uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Paula. Well, let, me, let me make this comment uh -huh. and you can, uh, ask your question any of you that has a report a committee report please email that in and uh, so that it can be added in the minutes because we are probably only about two minutes away and philip as i mentioned to you i need you to take over because i have another meeting to jump into here in a second so thank you very much and we will be seeing you all in the month of april Thank you. Thank you. And I have to run out the door too. So um, I've been trying to reach you, Sean. And my question, my concern is that the drivers of these taxi services for the city are not always treating the guests or the or the riders with decency and respect as well. So how do we address that? Because um, it did happen to me, and I. Uh, would rather get out and walk and i told them that because i'm not going to be subjected to abuse um so but at the same time i wouldn't get to my destination either so how do the um how do us writers and guests um address that okay for for one any kind of situation that you have within a taxi um, you can definitely call that taxi company and report those situations to 
uh, the folks in charge at that particular taxi company. Um, that helps. Also, you can feel free to give us a call here at the city and let us know about the particular issue and we can address it uh, that way as well. Obviously, you know, the none of the taxi companies are under any uh, contract necessarily with us, but obviously they do, uh, they do work um, for the city as an independent uh, contractor. Sean, this is uh, Robert. Uh, I, I just want to weigh on that with one sentence. They simply, many of them simply don't know how to deal with people. And so it seems like there could be some type of training on how to give uh, uh, aspects on how to work with customers. They have no training. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't. So, yeah, 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 I under, understand. Um, that is something that we definitely can work on. Like, like we talked about in the beginning, just that's just a, it's a whole customer service issue, right? So it's not just with um, dispatch. It's not just with the call center. Um, it's going to include taxis, uh, drivers, uh, you know, everybody involved with the system. So we're definitely um, taking a look at that. We do have some options with our um, contractor, um, MV. Um, uh, they have a great uh, training program for their drivers that uh, taxi drivers can be included in as well. Okay, so I also had called a service, a, a taxi service, and I was supposed to be on a will call because I did not know how long the event would take. And so I, they, when they brought me to the to the place, they said, "Well, I, I try to give you an idea, but I don't have any clue." So I gave an idea and they sent the taxi out at that time. And of course I wasn't done and, and I wasn't finished with what I was doing. So I didn't even know the taxi was out there. Um, when I called for the taxi, to uh, they, they were yelling at me. And I just told them, forget it. After um, 20 minutes of yelling at me, I, would, I just walked and fell down and ended up at the bus stop and took the bus the rest of the way. So um, this, this kind of behavior is not acceptable, but mm -hmm. I understood and I clearly got the um, definitions or, or the understanding of it. When you're on will call, you will call. And if they are available at that time, they'll send someone and if they got to wait an half an hour or even an hour, that's, you know, let us know. But, um, but to say, no, it's dark out now, we won't come and, and yell at me. That's not acceptable. Okay, so if you want to reach out um, to, to me and, and I can get some more specifics on the situation, I'd be glad to do that. I tried to reach you and I was unable to, but I did get to talk to Barb about it. Um, and the time of that return was 6.30 and not my, uh, my guess was 5.30, but it actually turned out to be um, almost 6.30. Um, and they said it was dark out, they didn't want to drive. So anyway, um, to me I think and um, I'm sorry. I think these are concerns that happen for a lot of people. Okay, okay, yeah. Just reach out to me, and um, we can discuss it, and I can get some more specifics from you. Um, that'll give me a, a better opportunity to um, kind of deal with the situation. Okay, thank you. But I do want to actually make contact with you. I appreciate that. Okay. Y'all have a sparkly St. Patty's Day today. Keep a smiling. Sparkly. <laughs> That's the only way to go, the Lord said. It won't cancel. It won't Mr. Best, you have a question? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, it's Donnie Best. I was just wanting to know for clarification, when you say that the uh, free rise will, as, as proposed up to this point, uh, through June uh, 23, uh, is that uh, essential trips or what, how is that classified? <laughs> that, that'll just continue to be the, the same way that it is right now. All, all fares would be free under those circumstances. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Abrams, this is Sharon Benton. Uh, hello. I just, hello, I just wanted to say that 
I have seen a slight improvement on some of the customer service issues that I've seen before uh, in that when I called my last set of trips in, I was, uh, I was uh, given a person who actually went over the trips with me before we hung up so that they could make sure that it was, that it was good and, and everything was okay. And I really appreciated that. So if that's, if that's one thing that we could just get done, that would be fantastic. Then maybe there yeah. would be fewer incidents. Right. Yeah. I am so glad you said that because that is one of the things I've been really pushing. So I'm glad to see that it's, it's working. And we'll, well continue to push that because that's an important piece, just going we, over the trip after it's uh, after you've given it. Well, you know, I worked for the city for 15 years in customer service, and we were required to make sure that that we did that. And, and that should be the case with anyone who works in customer service. They should go over things with you so that they can make sure they put it in right and that and that you said it right. Absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Absolutely. Good. Oh, cool. Let's just follow up one word here. Thank you, everybody, for your transportation comments, and thank you, Sean, for your transportation report. Um, we are past one o'clock, so I want to wrap up the meeting for people who need to leave to go to another meeting. But I'm glad that we have um, the spirited discussion because we've had other meetings earlier this year where, that I did early. I need to ask if there's any um, old mm. business or any new business to discuss. Uh, did anybody have older new business? Philip, this is Robert. Um, next month, uh, May Hidman or, or May Hidman from the North Carolina Weatherization um, Department. Uh, that's a the part of the Department of Energy will be our guest speaker. Okay. Uh, Philip, this is Donnie Best. I just want to acknowledge that uh, member Lawrence Carter and some of us know that uh, his relative, his mother-in-law passed away Monday and the funeral will be Saturday. Um, uh, his wife is Margaret Carter. Oh. A, lot of us, a lot of us know her. Uh, she's worked in the field of vision for a long time. But I uh, just want to acknowledge that his mother-in-law did, did pass uh, oh. at the glorious age of 85. 85. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Robert and Donnie, thank you very much for those updates. Does anybody else have all their new business? If not, this is Philip Woodward here. The date of our April meeting will be Thursday, April 21st. Oh, somebody's on the phone. Did you have something to say? Go ahead. Nope. Okay. Uh, well, it, it could have very well been me. Um, uh, Philip, I, I need, well, I needed to also say to the committee that uh, uh, I'm in the stages of planning a housing uh, panel discussion with uh, the bearded one, Demetrius. <laughs> um, we're going, um, I'm in a process of getting together a panel discussion on gentrification as it relates to blind and disabled persons. And that's slated to be on April the 20th but via Zoom at 7 o'clock p.m. Robert, thank you very much for that. April 20th at 7 o'clock p.m. 7 o'clock p.m. And I'll, I'll, I'll also make sure write that. Lori gets that information. And, I, and I'll I was write saying our next meeting will be Thursday, April 21st. And if Demetrius said that will be in person, possibly, so he will be giving us more information. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting today? I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you in April. All right. Second. Thank you. And um,
presenter who, who gave the PowerPoint. If you're still here, please send your PowerPoint to Demetrius and or Laurie Millette to share with the members. Thank you very much, everyone. And enjoy your St. Patrick's Day. Wear green or hold out the dollar bill as Ricky suggested <laughs> at the beginning of the meeting. And you'll yes. be covered and protected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. Thank you.